Rub up your engines! Hey, it's Scotty. It's going to be really cold where I live, and I'm using 5W30 synthetic blend motor oil. Should I go full synthetic? Yes. That's the one thing that's really the best for normal driving is that full synthetic oil flows much better in very cold weather. My fans that have cars up in Alaska, or up in the Northwest Territories in Canada, they use full synthetic oil because if it's 40, 50 below, and I'm not talking Celsius, I'm talking Fahrenheit, really cold, you got to have as much flow as you can possibly have. And if you got a good enough battery that can actually start your vehicle when it's that cold, you want to have full synthetic oil because it does flow a lot better under cold. It doesn't gel up and get real thick like molasses does in the cold. You want to go full synthetic if you live in a really cold area. Furry Drift King says 2005 E46 330 CI good first car only if you've got a rich daddy or if you're someone who has a sugar daddy <laughs> that has lots of money to spend on repairs. Those BMWs are endless money pits. You said 2005 I just had a 2006 over here the other day, and a guy says, I'm getting rid of this thing. I bought it used. I had enough fun out with it. I'm never going to throw any more money in this thing. I've already thrown five grand in parts and labor on it over the past three years. He's, he's tired of it. It's only a good first car if you have an endless money supply, and somebody else is paying for it. It's not your hard-earned money. Don't buy that as a first car if it's coming out of your pocket. Nathan Michael says 1996 Camry. The jitters when I let off the gas at highway speeds. Seems worse when it's cold. You let go of the gas and it jitters. I've had customers with those, and unfortunately, I mean, it's a very old car. It means the transmission is just wearing. That when you take your foot off the gas on the highway speeds and start, it starts jittering. It's because the transmission isn't downshifting right, and it's somewhat worn. Now, as long as it runs, what the heck? That thing's so old. Keep driving it. You might get more years out of it. Who knows? But that almost always means that the transmission itself is just starting to wear out. So, baby. I mean, it's not worth repairing. That might cost three, four grand to actually rebuild the transmission or put a factory rebuild on it. So just baby it. It means the transmission is starting to go out. Next question is John Favela. Scotty, my car brakes squeak without me pressing on. It drives me nuts. My mechanic replaced the whole brake system. I drive a 2003 Mustang. Well, your mechanic is an idiot. <laughs> He couldn't replace the whole system because if he did, it wouldn't be making any noise. They squeak because something is dragging. Either the calipers are sticking or the brake hoses aren't releasing the pressure or the master cylinder's not releasing the pressure or the brake booster is gone, not releasing the pressure. Go to another mechanic who knows what he's doing and he's going to be figuring it out. We, good mechanics, we can figure that stuff easy. You just drive around, you hear the squeak, then you bring it into the shop, you quick put it up in the air, put it in neutral, you start spinning the wheels. And if you see ones are dragging, those are the ones that are squeaking because they're dragging. Then you figure out why they're dragging. The guy that you have as a mechanic is an idiot, obviously. Or he's using really cheap parts. Like on Mustangs, I find if I use those Akabono pads, they don't make any noise. Sometimes guys bring me them and they don't want to spend money for new rotors. And I say, well, you know, most of the time if I put Akamono pads on, I don't even have to change the rotors. And I just put the pads on, don't change the rotors, and they stop squeaking. So find another mechanic who knows what he's doing and start there. The guy you're dealing with is an idiot. Zevi Seftinson says, Scotty, my car starts hard when it's warm, but no problem when cold. What do you think? All right, here's how cars work. When an engine is cold, it needs extra fuel. It likes extra fuel. If you start up a car and maybe the fuel injectors are leaking a little or the MAF sensor is off, so the computer sends too much fuel to the fuel injectors, it'll start right up because a cold engine likes extra fuel. A warm engine is the complete opposite. A warm engine likes a real lean mixture. If your car is warm and it's hard to start, it usually means that you got dripping fuel injectors, a leaking fuel pressure regulator, somehow you're getting too much fuel into the engine. And then if it starts up, you rev it up and it runs okay, that clears it out. Every once in a while, it can be a weak fuel pump because fuel pumps are all electronic now. So when an engine's cold and you start up the car, the fuel pumps have been resting. It might work for a few minutes. And then later, it gets hot and it starts to short out. So when it sits, it's it's too hot. It won't work right. Sometimes it can be that. You can test it, but more often it's leaking fuel injectors. Lando865 says, Scotty, on a 2009 to 2012 
Hyundai Genesis V6, V8 any good. Now, of course, they just call them Genesis because they decided that they're going upscale. They're not just calling them Genesis. And yes, they are higher quality than the cheaper ones. They're not nearly as quality as, say, a Lexus or an Acura in the long run. You're paying a lot of money for one of those if you're buying a brand new one. And if you're buying a used one, do have a mechanic like me. Check it out. A guy who understands them, not just some corner mechanic, a guy who really understands Japanese cars and has a big old $5,000 up scan tool where he can go through all the data and see if it's been wrecked, flooded, stolen, see if it has any problems. Because they are very high tech and if they start to have electrical problems, you do not want to buy it. King is good, said Scotty. I'm totally confused with looking at my dad's Nissan manual, my Honda's owner manual. They say at different temperatures they could use different oils for the Nissan, but Honda says use the same oil and I live in a hot climate. What should I do? Go buy what they suggest on the Nissan. You could use the little bit heavier oil that they say once it's hotter outside you can use the heavier oil. But with the Honda, stick with the one single oil. Honda engineers are very good at engines. Honda's the largest producer of four-stroke engines in the world. They know what they're doing and when they tell you to use a certain oil, use that certain oil. Doesn't need a heavier oil when it's warmer outside. If anything, you put a heavier oil, you can end up getting more wear on a variable valve timing and on the cams, the overhead cams, because it needs a light oil to flow when you start the car up. If you remember watching my previous videos, in May of 2020, they're coming out with a new oil here in the United States. You want to use that new oil in those, because the new oil is made for those engines. There's an A and a B. The A is backwards compatible, which you would use in an older vehicle like that, that's uh, 2010, 2012, 2014, and then on the new ones that went to 0W16, you would use the B one, which is made just for those engines. Hey, he says, hey Scotty, is a 2014 Mazda CX-5 with 60,000 kilometers a good car to buy? And in the past, I poo-pooed Mazdas. They are making them better than they used to, and a 2014 CX-5 with 60,000 kilometers, which is what, I don't know, 33,000 miles or something, low mileage, could be a very good car. So I always say, have a mechanic, check it out, you can't trust anybody, could be wrecked, flooded, stolen, you want to make sure that's not the case. But they are much better. In the 2014, Mazda didn't have the affiliation it did with Ford where they had problems. Now Mazda is becoming more affiliated with Toyota. They got a Mazda Toyota plant that I believe it's Alabama that they're building, where they're going to build Mazdas and Toyotas in the same assembly line. They are actually better made. The engines are better made the transmissions are better made. So it could be a very good car, but like I say, always have a used car checked out by a good mechanic. Don't trust anybody. People lie, cheat, and steal when they're selling used cars. So you got to have a guy check it out because you never know what might have happened in the past. Downside 123 says, Scotty, I got a 2013 Toyota Corolla, 85,000 miles. What could be causing function code P1604? I tried different scan tools. They all gave the same, but it starts perfectly fine. What should I look for? Change the battery. I see that all the time. What happens is put out a certain amount of electricity. Now we call them 12 volt batteries, but most of them, six cells. Each cell is 2.2 volts. So actually, they're 13.2 volt batteries. They put out a reasonable amount of power. Your car needs a lot of voltage and amperage to start the car. It's a big drain. If your battery is weak, your car still might start up, but the computer sees, uh-oh, there's a problem. We're not getting enough amperage or voltage to the starter, and it'll trip that stupid code. Now, you watch, because I fixed a whole bunch of them this way. Just go someplace like AutoZone that sells a lot of batteries, because you want a fresh battery. Batteries are like eggs. You don't want to get old ones that are rotten. You want fresh ones. Put it in. Put in a brand new battery. You'll probably find all your problems will be on. <laughs> you won't get that on anymore. Now, if you do get it on, oh, you can have all kinds of minor electrical problems as long as it starts. Go ahead. I check out a lot of cars these days for customers when they're buying a used car. And I often get that code. I'd say I get that code on probably 30, 40% of the cars I check out when I hook my big scan tool up. And it doesn't mean anything. It normally means the battery got flat or weak or it's going to need a new battery eventually. So put another battery in. And odds are with that, it'll just go away. A man was convicted and admitted that he did it in court. He controlled his ex-girlfriend's Range Rover remotely. He put webcam in there so you watch what she's doing, and he also had it set up so they could do that start-stop function. If he didn't want her to start the car, if he saw she was in the wrong place or headed somewhere, he could turn it so have any ability to start a car and drive it around. Now, realize all of those things, none of them are made so you can shut it off while you're driving. That's too dangerous. It's like the anti-theft ones. Shut it off once it stops somewhere and it shows you the location, and he knew the location of where she was too. And this wasn't 
wasn't his, even his girlfriend or his wife. This is his ex girlfriend. Well, luckily, his ex girlfriend was in tech herself, so she figured out what was going on pretty fast and ended up suing him. And six months later, he pled guilty for it because she had all the proof she needed that he was stalking her with high tech stuff on a Land Rover. Hey, it's another reason to have a lower tech car. You can't really stalk people in a low tech car, but in a high tech car like that Land Rover, hey, believe you me, there's computer nerds out there that I'm sure they'd be able to hack into one of those cars if they really wanted to and mess with your mind. So maybe low tech is better in this case. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.